Section 16 of Between the Larchwoods and the Weir. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Between the Larchwoods and the Weir by Flora Clickman. Chapter 16 The Meeting at the Cottage. I have been wondering, the rector began, if it would be possible for you to let us have a temperance meeting here in your cottage. I feel sure it would be productive of good, and we sadly need more aggressive temperance work in this parish, and a little gathering in a private house would be more of a novelty than one held in the parish room or at the rectory. A temperance meeting, I repeated rather hesitatingly, I confess, I knew well enough that there was work waiting to be done in this direction, but whether those who most needed reforming could be got inside my door was quite another matter. Oh, but I am not meaning an evening meeting for the purpose of reaching the men themselves, the rector explained. My idea is to have an afternoon ladies' meeting to discuss more particularly the question of prohibition. We might eventually get up a week of meetings in various parts of the district, only it all wants talking over. There are a number of ladies who would be willing to aid if only some definite scheme were put before them. If you would issue the invitations, I know they would be only too pleased to come, and we could possibly get a committee appointed as the initial step in the proceedings. I saw at once that the idea was a practical one. Quite a goodly handful of ladies would be available from house dotted here and there upon the hillside, so we made a list of those living near enough to me to be invited. Now, have we overlooked anybody? I said finally, going down the list once more. It included the manor house, and one or two other large country houses where I knew the people would be sympathetic, the rest being cottage residences and small places inhabited by people of the educated classes who kept simple, unassuming establishments some from choice, some because their means were small. In several cases the ladies dispensed with any servant, finding that life's problems and breakages and finger marks were much reduced when they did the work themselves. By the way, there are two visitors in the place at present who would like to come, I am sure, said the rector. One is a very nice girl, who has been doing V.A.D. work since the beginning of the war. She is here recruiting after a nervous breakdown and is boarding at the Joneses' farm. I know she would appreciate an invitation. I duly wrote down her name. And the other, Miss Togsy, is a literary lady and is lodging with old Mrs. Perkins. Do you happen to know her name? I had never heard it before. Ah, neither had I, but then that would not be remarkable. Only she seemed surprised to think I did not know of her, though, as far as I can ascertain, she has never actually published anything. She is engaged on some book of research, which she regards as an important contribution to the literature of the times, though for a moment the subject has escaped my memory. She is so exceedingly anxious to meet you, in fact, she uh, uh, suggested that I should take her with me to call on you. But I told her that you come down here for rest and quiet and to escape the conventionalities of society. She is rather a, a persistent lady, however, and she says her admiration for you is unbounded. So possibly, if you have no objection, it might make a pleasant interlude if she were invited also. I was not very anxious to have her, but I agreed, as the rector seemed to wish it. Still, I am afraid my smile was a trifle ironical, as I tailed the list with her name. Unfortunately, the very day of the meeting was the one suddenly selected by Abigail's sister for her wedding. Of course, I insisted that Abigail must not miss the function, and sent her back to town the day before. But when the preparations were divided between the three of us, they did not amount to much in the way of extra work, 
and Ursula made herself responsible for the fresh relays of tea that would be necessary for new arrivals. As is the custom in the country, everybody walked round the garden to see how the things were coming on, and we all compared notes with each other's gardens, and, of course, everybody complimented me on the forwardness of my things, as in duty bound, seeing they were drinking my tea. The V.A.D. proved a delightful girl, very nervous at first, but very appreciative, and as all my other visitors were fully engaged in chatting together in twos and threes, I devoted myself to the shy outsider. The literary lady had not yet appeared. I come up every day and look over the wall at your flowers, the girl said. I believe they've done me far more good than the tonic I've been taking. I invariably take a dose of them myself when I'm run down, I replied. We were wandering around the narrow paths between the beds edged with pieces of grey stone. The paths were beginning to be weedy, and the garden was a mixture of early and late spring flowers, owing to the undue length of the winter. But for the V.A.D. there were no imperfections. I've never seen cowslips like these before, and she stooped and touched them lovingly. Those mahogany-coloured ones are so rich, and I like the deep reddy orange ones too. Oh, I like them all, she added with a sigh of pleasure. And when I was ill in London, before they sent me down here, I felt as though I should die if I couldn't get away somewhere, where there were flowers and sunshine, and where the trees and foliage were fresh and clean. Wherever I looked there were grey skies, and dingy houses, and discoloured paint, and dirty streets, and miserable-looking squares, and sooty stuff that it was pitiful to call grass, and smoke and mud, all the same colour, and equally stupefying. Do you think that dirt can get on people's nerves? I nodded. Don't I know only too well how the grime and gloom and all-pervading sordidness of big cities can get on one's nerves? Don't I know how in time they seem to corrode one's very soul and dull one's vision till faith itself can become clouded and hope goes and all one's work seems of no avail? But the merciful Lord has provided an antidote. It was a tree he showed at the waters of Mara, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, in more senses than one. The girl continued her confidences. When I lay awake at night with insomnia, I used to shut my eyes and think out the garden I wanted to find. It wasn't a grand garden, or a gorgeous one that I used to plan. Carpet bedding and terraces with beds of geraniums and peacocks would have tired me to arrange in proper style just then. The garden I wanted was the sort of happy place where flowers seemed to grow of their own accord, with no one to worry them about tidy habits. And then it was quite remarkable. The day after I arrived here, I chanced upon the lane leading to your cottage, and there I saw the very garden I had been so longing for, and the masses of flowers and colour I had been quite hungry to see. I could hardly tear myself away from the little gate. Of course, the florists wouldn't think much of me for saying it, but although I admire with real wonder the magnificent blooms they exhibit at shows, I would rather have that piece of rocky wall with its wallflowers on the top than the most expensive orchids they could show me. But perhaps all this seems rather childish to you. Yet it didn't. I knew exactly what she meant, and every flower lover will understand it too. There are times when I go a good deal farther than the V.A.D. and actually object to some of the improvements on nature horticulturalists think they can make. What is gained by trying to produce rhododendrons looking like gypsophila, while at the same time they're trying to get gypsophila looking like peonies? What purpose is served in the modern craze for getting every flower to look like any other flower excepting itself? While I don't mean to imply that I am so narrow as to object to attempts at horticultural development, 
there certainly are limits to desirable expansion, as Shakespeare very well knew. But I had no time to say more, for as she was speaking, I caught sight in the distance of a stalwart, aggressive-looking female with an arm full of manuscripts and walking stick clasped to her waist belt and clad in a long, loose, tussour silk coat. We were all wearing them short at the moment that she clutched to her chest with her other hand as it had lost its fastenings and was threatening to blow away. Her hat was of the fluffy, girly description, somewhat bizarre in shape, which looked preposterous above the lady's mature locks, more especially as she had put it on hind part front, not even bothering herself to ascertain its compass points. Miss Togsy, was blandly unconscious of any incongruity in her personal appearance, and entered the gate with the assured step of mind quite oblivious of matter. Precipitating herself on Ursula, the only hatless person in sight, hence evidently not a fellow guest, she exclaimed in a strident voice, The editor of the women's magazine, I believe. So glad to meet you. I've been longing to know you. "'So kind of you to ask me to this delightful gathering, etc. "'Now, as I told Ursula later, "'if she had been a true friend, "'she would merely have smiled sweetly "'and wafted the new arrival into the house "'and silenced her with refreshments. "'Instead of which, she meanly disclaimed all editorial connections "'and piloted her up the garden to me.' whereupon we began all over again. I waited patiently till she reached a semicolon, and then invited her to come indoors and have some tea. No tea for me, thank you, she exclaimed, in tones of stern disapproval. I never touch tea. Perhaps you would like some milk and a sandwich. Oh, no, I never take flesh foods of any description. I adhere strictly to the fruit diet which nature has so bountifully provided for our use. If you happen to have a banana or a few muscatels, I hadn't. It's of no consequence, she said, with an air of kindly tolerance for my shortcomings. I'm perfectly happy here under the blue dome of heaven. My other guests seemed to have had enough of her already and were making their way towards the house as it was nearly time to start the meeting. But Virginia linked her arm in that of the VAD and followed close at my heels. For her, the lady promised to be interesting. Oh, what adorable croci, the newcomer went on without any break, apostrophizing a few late crocuses that were already looking jaded. And those daisies, I do so love daisies, don't you? We modest crimson-tipped flowers. You remember the poet's allusion, of course. So appropriate. The flowers she was pointing at with her knotty walking stick were particularly large, buxom-looking red double daisies, a prize variety that not even the imagination of a poet could have described as we. It's wonderful how literature opens one's eyes to the beauties of nature. I always say read the poets. Then it will not matter whether you stay in town or country. Nature will be an open book to you. Undoubtedly, the literary lady had arrived, and she was bent either on improving or on impressing us. The poets take you into the very heart of things. A primrose by a river's brim. Where can you find a truer picture of the simple wayside flower? And isn't that an exquisite line? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. I entirely agree with Shakespeare in this, which was nice of her. It is just as I was saying. It really doesn't matter whether you know a single flower individually or whether you have ever seen a flower, in fact. All nature can be yours. I consider it criminal to neglect the poets. Wherever the eye wanders, she went on, it recalls some great truth that has been crystallised for us by literary men. Evidently the flowers themselves were of small count, 
all that mattered was what pen and ink could make out of them. And lady smocks all silver white. It was evident that she was warming to the work and going farther afield, for here the stick took a dangerous sweep round in mid-air. Virginia saved her head by dodging it, and was now pointing into the copse the other side of the garden wall, where the anemones were still in bloom. "'I simply revel in ladies' smocks, don't you?' she said ardently to Virginia, and then smiled expansively into the copse, though there wasn't a solitary lady's smock there. "'For my own part, I must say I prefer doxies,' said Virginia sweetly. "'The doxy over the dale, as Shakespeare so beautifully expresses it. Don't you just love them?' The B.A.D. had turned her back on us and was studying the distant hills. Virginia, I interpolated hurriedly, for I scented trouble immediately ahead. Isn't that the rector coming up the lane? Then we must be getting indoors. But the literary lady had not nearly said all she had come intending to say, so she told me as we walked to the house that she herself was engaged on a most exhaustive literary work entitled the cosmic evidences of woman's supremacy. Yes, I said, in a blank tone of voice that wasn't intended to commit me to anything. I've handled many similarly exhaustive manuscripts in my time, and I've met many authoresses of the same, and my one terror was lest she should start to give me a detailed synopsis of each chapter. But fortunately... We reached the house before she could get fairly launched. After the opening hymn and prayer, the rector briefly sketched his idea in calling the meeting together, and after reminding us how desirable it was at a time like this that some active campaign should be set afoot to combat the drunkenness that had been such a bane to our land, he asked if any ladies who had suggestions to make would kindly speak briefly and to the point. Hardly had he sat down before the literary lady was on her feet, urging upon us all the necessity for giving up our inebriate habits. You would have thought she was addressing loafers inside a public house. I sat as patiently as I could, waiting for her to sit down and give place to someone else who at least knew whom they were addressing. But next moment I found, to my amazement, that she was lecturing us on the advantages of a fruitarian diet, assuring us that most of the evils flesh is heir to, including drunkenness, would be done away with if we only chained our appetites to fruit. She was blissfully unaware that the cause of all the trouble in our district was cider. After every form of food that was not fruit had been abused, she passed on, by a transition that seemed easy to her, but unaccountable to everyone else, to the question of woman's suffrage, and we learnt that another cause for drunkenness was to be found in the fact that women had had no votes. And then it dawned upon me that we had let ourselves in for an afternoon with some irresponsible crank. It really seemed as though she meant to go on forever. The rector's gentle and courteous attempts to stem the rushing torrent were not of the slightest avail. He tried to interpolate a remark now and again, but she never even heard him. She was addressing us at the very top of her voice. Of course, he ought to have stopped her at the very outset, but then the situation was one he had never before been called upon to face in the whole of his seventy years. Hers was the first female voice to be raised in our parish in defiance of the rector. Equally, of course, I ought to have stopped her, but one hesitates to take the initiative in such a case when there is a chairman, and eventually I let matters get quite beyond me. I did rise at the back of the room and try to ask a few questions, but all in vain. The speaker never paused, and at last I meekly sat down again, while Virginia and Ursula, with the VAD between them, suffocated in their handkerchiefs and showed distinct signs of getting out of hand. Besides, what can anyone do under such circumstances? I asked Ursula, who once attended election meetings, what it was usual to do, and she said, 
You just turn them out when they talk too much. But who was to turn her out, and how do you set about it? It was evident from her absurd and illogical statements that neither the Fruitarians nor the Woman's Suffrage Party owned her or would have authorised her to advocate their claims. She was merely one of those women one meets occasionally who take up every new craze that comes along and get on their feet and speak about their latest hobby, in season and out of season, having not the slightest sense of proportion and of the fitness of things. Such a woman loves to hear her own voice and imagines that other people love to hear it too. After half an hour of this sort of thing, the lady of the manor took her departure, not very quietly either. As I stepped outside in the porch to bid her a mournful goodbye, she pressed my hand and murmured, You poor dear, do let me know who finally chokes her. How we should have silenced her eventually, I don't know, but the matter was taken out of our hands by no less important a personage than Johnny, the boy who delivered the bread from the village shop. Unable to find any Abigail at the kitchen door, he had come along to the other door to know how many loaves I required. From my seat in the room, I tried to indicate by dumb pantomime that I wanted one loaf. Miss Smith caught sight of him, and remembering that she was two miles away from any bread if he overlooked her, she told him in a clear voice not to forget to leave her a loaf. Then everyone else in the room woke up to the fact that Johnny was outside, and with one accord they all asked him if he had remembered them, or told him how many loaves to leave, and no one troubled in the slightest whether it interfered with the speaker or not. In fact, they seemed to enjoy the clatter they were making. Johnny, being attacked by so many voices at once, stood on the doorstep and addressed the room stolidly and respectfully. I've left your loaf on the window ledge, Miss Primkins, and I put two for you in the fork of the apple tree, Miss Robinson, so as the dog can't get at it as he's loose. And Miss Jones, yourn is on the garden seat, and I've a put Mrs. Wilson's atop of the wood pile with a bit of paper under it undue favouritism to Mrs. Wilson, we all thought, and I've left your nutmegs and soda and coffee on the doorstep, Miss White, and I drive a cow out of your garden what had got in, Miss Parker. The gate was left open, but he's latched up all right now. At this intelligence, the room gave a general shuffle, preparatory to a stampede. Why, the cow might have got into every garden. Who could tell? And only those who have cherished gardens in the country know what terrible import lurked in the words, a gate was left open. The rector, seeing where matters were trending, said we would close with a hymn. Before he had given out more than one line, Ursula did what she had never done before, and has never done since, raised the tune. She said it was sheer hysterics made her do so. At any rate, we all took it up vigorously, because we saw the literary lady was trying to add a postscript to her previous remarks. It's true, Ursula started us on a six-line tune, whereas the verses were only four lines each, but fortunately I discovered it in time and repeated the last two lines to save the situation. The people all left hurriedly as soon as the benediction had been pronounced most of them looking unutterable at things at me for having let them in for such a time. The literary lady alone seemed to have enjoyed herself, and went away leaving the bundle of manuscripts she had brought, after telling me that she intended to call on me the very next afternoon and bring me the cosmic evidences, as she felt sure it would be the very thing for my magazine. The unkindest cut of all, however, was the farewell remark made by the vicar's niece as she was adjusting her bonnet strings. I can't think why on earth you ever asked that individual to address us, but I suppose she is some personal friend of yours? When the two girls and I were left alone with the general disorder that always prevails after one's guests have gone, Ursula made some tea, and Virginia brought in what was left of the festal fare, and we sat around the fire and ate in melancholy silence. I'm going to town by the very first train tomorrow, I said at last. So am I, 
fervently ejaculated the other two in unison. "'And may I never set eyes or ears on that fruit creature again,' added Virginia, as she set down her plate with an air of a pain in her chest after her sixth cucumber sandwich. "'But, though I escaped the lady's next call, I had not got to the end of her. She sent an avalanche of manuscripts to my office.' and called persistently in person. Howbeit, she never was troubled to walk beyond the inquiry office, and her manuscripts were always returned to her with the utmost promptitude. Some weeks later, Virginia and I, after doing some shopping in the stores, turned into the refreshment room for lunch. I do not know any place where a more varied assortment of feminine idiosyncrasies thrust themselves upon one's notice than in the ladies' luncheon room. Neither do I know any place where you can hear, within a given space of time, more particulars of the births, marriages, ailments and deaths, plus a wealth of intervening data, of people you know nothing about than in that self-same room. We had hardly taken our seats at a table before we were accompanying our next-door neighbour to a dentist, she being in a state of complete nervous prostration, full symptoms given, and having four teeth extracted, most obstinate one that came out in eleven separate pieces, with gas that wouldn't take, italicised description of what the victim underwent and was conscious of in her half-gone condition. After this, we dallied through an exceedingly comprehensive catalogue of what she had been able to take in the way of nourishment, since the momentous occasion, and finally received, with breathless interest, the important information as to the exact date when she would be once more fully equipped for dinner parties. On our right, two more were discussing, with gusto, the doings, none of them apparently what she ought to have done, of a bride who had recently entered their family. Our own corner of the room was so engaging that we did not notice the newcomers who were finding seats at other tables. But suddenly, above the general chatter, there arose the sound of a strident voice that there was no possibility of mistaking. Virginia and I gasped simultaneously, and there, a short distance away from us, though fortunately with its back towards us, we beheld the fluffy hat, right side front this time, above a screw of hair, and the long tussore coat of recent blessed memories. The literary lady had a friend with her, but obviously the friend didn't count for much. She hadn't a chance. At most she only squeezed in a word when the other made a semi-pause for breath. We sat spellbound, and this is what we heard. Now, dear, what are you going to have? They have soup, roast beef, roast lamb and mint sauce, roast mutton, and so on. She declaimed the menu to the bitter end, while a long-suffering waitress stood first on one tired foot and then on the other. "'Oh, but you must have something more than a bun. Nonsense! That was hours ago. I had mine late, too, but I'm quite ready for lunch. On strict diet, are you? That doesn't count. Specialists always say that sort of thing. That's what you pay the money for, but it doesn't follow that you have to do what they say. Why?' You'd starve to death if you did, and then you'd have to go to them again and pay another fee. Though I dare say that's their idea. You'd like a little roast lamb? Well, I might manage a little too, if it's very hot. But I expect they've only got it about lukewarm. If the roast lamb isn't quite... What? It's cold? All the joints are cold? The waitress says it's cold, dear. Isn't it simply ridiculous in a place like London never to be able to get a hot lunch? What? The grill is hot? But my good girl, I don't want any grill. And the soup and fish? I don't want either soup or fish. No, and I don't want hot steak and kidney pie. I wanted hot roast lamb. Still, if you haven't it, I suppose it isn't your fault. All the same, it does seem as if you are... Sausages, did you say? They would be rather nice. Now are they hot or cold? 
which smoked only smoked sausages did you ever know such a place what do you say to oysters you thought i only took fruit i tried that for a little while my last doctor but one was very keen on it but if you believe me i was losing pounds a week i should have been a perfect skeleton by now if i'd gone on so i went to another man and he insisted absolutely insisted that i must take food containing a larger percentage of proteins and i wasn't sorry i never had any faith in that fruit idea only i met that doctor when i was at the hydro and he begged me to try it a most charming man and he took the greatest interest in my writings but someone told me only last week that he has a wife who is a positive salmon is that salmon i didn't notice it that wouldn't be bad would it and the very best thing you could have as your dieting so digestible i always find now where's that girl gone i declare they slip away the minute your back's turned and they don't give you a moment to look at the menu is that for our waitress over there i think it is she has on an apron just like the girl who was here that's true now you mention it their aprons are all alike still i think that was the one and she's gone over there on purpose to be out of reach but i'll go to her here virginia and i narrowly escaped detection for the literary lady strode across the room knocking down other people's umbrellas in passing brushing one lady's velvet stole from the back of a chair and kicking over a tray that had been put down in apparently the most out of the way spot in the room clutching the arm of the waitress who belonged to our table and had no dealings with the other end of the room she demanded immediate service instinctively virginia and i bent our heads forward as low as possible over our plates and fortunately the wide brims of our hats helped to conceal our features but we only breathed freely when she returned to her seat to report to her friend that waitress says the other girl will be back in a minute but i doubt it there now she's gone off too ah ah here's ours at last now dear you said sausage didn't you or did we decide on oysters you're right it was salmon i always think that salmon what did you say why of course we want bread we couldn't eat it without could we oh i see you mean bread or roll she says will you have bread or roll dear yes rolls would be nice but waitress not crusty ones well, well perhaps bread would be softer for you under the circumstances stale bread waitress those rolls are usually as hard as yes perhaps we had better decide on what we will have to drink i'm going to have lime juice you'd better have some too it goes so well with salmon of course they have coffee if you really prefer it but i do think that lime juice well if that girl hasn't gone off again they do nothing but run about from pillar to post oh she's bringing the other things that isn't brown bread waitress i said brown bread surely i must have said brown bread because i positively cannot touch anything else don't you remember i called you back and said brown bread waitress well if you can change it that's all right wait a minute though after all i think i'll have white yes you can leave it but all the same i can't think why people never listen to what one says here half the room broke out into an unconcealed smile i e the half that had found it impossible to raise their voices above hers and so had finally given it up as hopeless and now devoted themselves to listening but all oblivious of everything but herself she continued i don't like the look of that salmon i feel sure it's been frozen is that the best you have it looks to me like new zealand or canterbury salmon really everything seems to be made in germany nowadays doesn't it and no mayonnaise it's in the cruet i never care for that bottled stuff oh yes leave it but i wish now that we had had oysters it's no use offering to change it we've done nothing else so far but have wrong things 
brought to us to have changed, or at least it would have been changed if I hadn't consented to put up with the white bread. But you can bring us some lime juice. Now don't forget this time and bring ginger beer. Yes, lime juice for two. But I thought you agreed to lime juice just now. Oh, have what you like by all means. I don't mind what it is. I only advised lime juice because coffee is so very bad for anyone on diet, and you can't be too careful. Still, please yourself, only do let us decide on something, or she'll be off again. That's it, one coffee and one lime juice. Yes, with plenty of milk. Now, I wonder if that scatterbrained girl will go and put the milk in the lime juice. You were surprised to hear I was back in town. I returned last week. I absolutely couldn't have existed on that benighted hilltop another hour. I knew the moment I set eyes on it that it wasn't sufficiently cooked. Nobody could be expected to eat it. She must get us something else. Waitress! This salmon isn't half done. It's as soft as... Oh, I see. Yours is hard? Well, at any rate, it isn't what it ought to be. Mine is quite spongy, and this lady's is as hard as... The skin, is it? This lady's skin is just like leather. I suppose it had better be oysters. Now, I wonder how much longer she'll keep us waiting. But as I was saying, they were the dullest, most bucolic set of people I ever came across, not a thought above their fowls and cabbages. I tried to discuss art and literature with them, simple things, not too far above their heads, you know, just to draw them out but they merely gazed at me in utter blankness. Yes, she has a cottage there. I'd forgotten I mentioned it in my letter. Oh, yes, I met her. In fact, she persuaded me to address a drawing-room meeting at her house. She got it up on purpose, hearing I was in the district. I could ill afford to spare the time for my book, but she wrote and made such a point of it that I could hardly refuse without seeming rude. She invited a number of the local people to meet me, but a more stupid, unimpressionable collection of, what is she like? Most ordinary. As you know, I am endowed with unusual intuition and can gauge people and sum them up in a moment, and I must say, I found her a very uninteresting person, not to say exceedingly heavy. "'Which only proves,' said Virginia, when we got outside, "'that even the worst of us may profit by hearing the truth spoken in love.'" End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Between the Larchwoods and the Weir This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo Between the Larch Woods and the Weir by Flora Clickman Chapter 17 Moon Gold in the Garden The flame of August is over all the garden, a blaze of yellow and scarlet, orange and red, for most of the blues and pinks go out with July though the lavender flowers are opening intensely blue, and big clumps of eryngium with blue stems as well as blue flower heads make masses of contrasting color amidst the sunflowers, single and double, and the eschultzias and marigolds glowing golden and undaunted by the hottest sunshine. The flowers of the red-hot poker rival their namesakes, broad spreading clumps of Montebrescia, each waving hundreds of fiery orange and red blossoms, have sprung into existence since last we were here, from lowly, modest-looking patches of green blades. The second crop of Gloire de Dijon roses are out, likewise holding in their hearts remembrance of the hot sunshine that pervades the earth. Geraniums, turned out of doors, to get a little air, though there certainly isn't much to get just now, are shouting aloud in pride 
of their heavy scarlet bosses the mountain ash trees contribute plenty of color each branch bent down with a smother of a bunches of berries which are being eagerly devoured by blackbirds thrushes and hawfinches tall red and yellow hollyhocks try to persuade you that they are nearly as high and quite as brilliant as the mountain ash nasturtiums trail all over the place climbing where there is next to nothing to support them with flowers so thick you lose count of the foliage and what a dazzling mass they make touched apparently with every shade of yellow and brown and red from blossoms of palest primrose marked with vivid scarlet past salmon color streaked with orange and lemon yellow splashed with chocolate to dark mahogany red smoked with deep purple brown they smother weeds that gain in impudence as the season advances and cover bare places where bulbs and earlier blooming plants have died down they hang over the tops of walls they crowd the border pinks into the paths they get mixed up with the hedges and surprise you by sending out vermilion flowers at the top of a sedate old box tree clipped to look like a solid square table they run out of the little white gate into the lane and they creep under the rails into the orchard indeed there are times when their exuberance almost makes one tired more especially if the thermometer favors the nineties the garden walls are teeming with color sweet alyssum has seated itself wherever it can find a spare niche rather a difficulty unless a plant goes house hunting quite early in the season though the white and purple arabis finished flowering months ago it contributes crimson and purple to the color scheme as its foliage ripens in the hot sun any intelligent gardener can tell me that the top of a sunny wall is far too hot for a fuchsia certainly and of course it is especially in august yet some misguided person had one planted there just where the wall has a break in it and a flight of steps leads down to the next level it is the lovely old-fashioned bush sort smothered with slender drooping blossoms and it reaches out long arms that arch right over the steps and as you go down unless you lower your head you set a tinkling scores of crimson bells with rich blue purple centers and people who understand all about fuchsias glare at it severely and then at me and remark a most unsuitable position and where nothing else in particular is making any sort of a show the ubiquitous herb robert spreads itself about on the top of the walls or roots and crevices down the sides it is in particular where so long as there are stones that need clothing with a loveliness there you will find it laying its crimson leaves with a lacy airiness over the stern surface of the rock the very scents of the garden are hot and pungent as one rubs against thyme and marjoram or the great sage bush that smothers one wall the trees of sweet bay were cut in the morning the rosemary bushes had to be trimmed where their branches were lying on the ground someone has stepped on pieces in passing all day long the heat strikes down on the parched cracking earth baking the stones shriveling up any fern fronds that chance to catch its direct rays drying up the little brook and testing the powers of endurance of the scarlets and yellows orange and reds that are flaunting themselves in the face of the sun to sit out of doors is only possible beneath the firs and larches in the green shade by the wood house where the sun never penetrates and even here it makes one warm to watch the glare beyond the thicket of trees the hot air quivering nothing but butterflies and dragonflies about and not to break a breathless silence but the twitter of the tits grub hunting in the larches and the perpetual hum of uncountable insects who seem to find 
no heat too great but presently the shadows of the pines begin to lengthen and in the shade thrown by the larches along the meadow side blackbirds are seen making short runs along the ground on foraging expeditions chaffinches tits linnets and bullfinches come out from green hiding places and go down to the bird's bath to drink longer grow the shadows the swallows rise and take high curving sweeps in the upper air wonderful little aeronauts whom no man has trained as the sun touches the top of the opposite hills a breeze wakes up the birchwood whispering that the sunset will soon be here and the leaves start talking about the stifling heat that so exhausted them through the day the sun drops lower behind the hill rabbits peep out from beneath the brambles then make for the hummocky field that adjoins my cabbages the field where the big oaks stretch wide arms over soft green luscious grass ophas oaks we have named these ancient giants because they border ophas dyke and they have so often described to the more youthful birch trees the time when they saw ofa king of mercia come marching past in 765 a d that at length they have actually come to believe they were alive and flourishing in his day we humour their age by pretending that it was so at last the sun disappears flaming to the last in crimson and gold orange and red the breeze gets lustier after the sun has gone under and a squirrel comes scampering head first down a tall fir tree in search of a delicious toadstool that he sometimes finds at its base pheasants strut up out of the coppice and roam about the pasture imperceptibly you know not whence it comes there steals over the earth the cool refreshing scent of dew-drenched bracken mingling with the sweet wistful evening incense of some late honeysuckle and as you watch the fading afterglow of pink and saffron sea-green and tawny rose you sense that in some mysterious way the face of the garden has entirely changed gone is the fire of the scarlet geraniums lost is the vermilion of the nasturtiums even the sunflowers hang their heads and the hollyhocks have turned off their lights the marigolds have closed their eyes and the eschultzias have folded up their brave flowers the tired little heads bowing over thankful for this respite then as the montbrichas toll the angelus from crowds of golden-throated bells the evening primroses silently gratefully open a thousand blossoms and bathe the garden in a wondrous gleam such a clear clean yellow it is so quiet and yet so penetrating it seems in some strange way to hold the radiance of heaven and focus it on the sleeping flower patch subduing all that would strike a glaring note hiding the ragged deficiencies of fading leaves and withering seed pods by day one scarcely notice the straggling plants at all save perhaps to remark on their rather shabby appearance but now they shine from terraces and wall tops from crannies and the rough stone steps they send up tall shafts bearing aloft their evening lamps about the garden beds among the currant bushes at the edge of the gravel walk between the stones in the paved path wherever they can find root room they have taken hold for they were ever wanderers and given to exploring the farthermost corner of any garden wherein they have made themselves at home the last rose-pink flush has faded from the clouds not even a sleepy twitter is heard from bush or bough the wind soughs softly in the pine trees those harps of endless strings from out of her hidden stores of abundance nature has given moisture to the grass refreshment to the fainting foxglove leaves and damped the forest fern 
then breathing quiet on a weary world has bidden it take rest yet all are not asleep standing like sentinels through the darkest hour of night the evening primroses adding scent to scent flood the garden from end to end with a veritable glory of swaying gleaming moon gold end of chapter seventeen moon gold in the garden chapter eighteen of between the larch woods and the weir this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo between the larch woods and the weir by flora clickman chapter eighteen the carillon of the wilds of all the host of alluring things that make for themselves homes on our hillside one of the most lovely is the foxglove yet there is no blatancy about its beauty nor a great blaze of light as when the oxeye daisies wave over the fields in june there is something more subtle than even its colouring that attracts one to this flower for there is mind rest there is balm for anxious hearts there is new hope and new courage with whispers of happiness in the depths of a foxglove bell if you doubt this go on a foxglove quest leave everything bearing the hallmark of advanced up-to-dateness far behind you though i have nothing to say against the train that takes you away from towns to the place where the foxgloves grow forget all the regulation ways of enjoying yourself and search out the haunts of the carillon of the wilds you will find them on the shady sides of the hedges their spikes of bells pushing up through hawthorn and slow through the tangle of bramble and byrony cleavers and dog rose that scramble over the pollarded nut bushes beeches elm stumps and ash bowls amid all the dear delights that go to make that poem of loveliness an english hedgerow you will also find them in little hollows and dells in small ravines and in craggy places in any spot where they can get a little moisture for the roots and occasional sunshine for the flowers with a certain amount of immunity from the devastating hand of the human marauder give them but a ghost of a chance to seed themselves though this is what the greedy flower gatherer invariably denies them and they will spread with great rapidity and paint the face of nature with a rich glowing carmine that almost makes you hold your breath when first you see the broad sweeps of colour on certain hillsides in mid-june when you have found them in any of their haunts lift one of the bells and look right into it the lighting and the splashes and markings the fine filaments and the silken texture the pink and purple and crimson the dark brown and white the poise of the stalk the droop of the bells the balance that the leaf arrangement gives to the whole plant and the many other characteristics that go to make up one of the most exquisite of nature's products the trouble is that in sparse soil or in wind-swept places the plant does not grow so tall as in a protected and secluded spot hence when we meet it in the open its bells hang downwards below the eye-line and we do not often remember to stoop and lift one to see what message the bee left for us perhaps that is one reason why it seems to me that while sunflowers and hollyhocks spend their days in gazing after grown-ups foxgloves are forever nodding smilingly and encouragingly to little children to those who are accustomed to agricultural scenery where the landscape shows far expanses of pasture-land and cornfields with wide-spreading low-roofed farms clustered around with barns and ricks our hills come at a surprise 
with their uneven surfaces and the scarcity of soil in comparison with his superabundance of rock and even taking into consideration all the cleared spaces and small farms the outstanding feature of the country so far as the eye can see is timber this is a region of woods and coppices with springs that bubble up at the roots of sturdy trees protected by their thick leafage from the onslaughts of the sun this is a land of dim gray green mystery of silences that make one tread with reverent awe till one is brought back to earth by the ring of the woodman's axe the leisurely song of his saw and the crish crash of a tree as it falls in the course of time the woods have to be cut some are cut every fourteen years others are left much longer it all depends on the kind of tree and the purpose for which it is being grown but though the woods are cut periodically it is not so devastating a process as one might imagine for one thing it is clean work for another it is surface work and then it is all done in the open air with hand tools and no machinery and it is carried out on nature's own lines hence there is no underground disturbance that would prevent further growth and no smoke of power-driven machinery pollutes the earth and air yet there would be something very pathetic about the felling of the trees as you walk over ground that has been cut were it not for the magical display of beauty nature puts forth in such circumstances multitudes of flowers springing into being that otherwise would not have come to birth at first you see but the prostrate trunks of the trees with the ivy still clinging to the bark there they lie with branches lopped each surrounded by piles of small timber cut into regulation lengths for various commercial purposes with cords of faggots for firing and stacks of stuff for pea sticks and similar purposes yet you are not long wandering over the newly cleared slopes before you see things that were not evident before in winter you discover a red gold carpet too golden to be brown too brown to be red where lie the leaves of the beeches that you never noticed when the trees were standing then as spring breathes life into the sleeping earth the dead leaves stir silently mysteriously no human ear can detect the rustle no human eye can see the movement yet the leaves lift and move apart disclosing the yellow and green and silvery pink of the primrose buds still further the dead leaves lift and the violets look out and then run all over the place the wind flowers push up next and before you realize what has happened the place is literally dancing with them where did they all come from last spring you went through this very wood and saw only a few scattered about at wide distances where there is chance to be a filter of light through the dense branches overhead now the place is an open-air ballroom of curtsying sprites such are the wonderful ways of the woods in sheltered spots where the cold winds cannot reach cushions of wood sorrel unfurl their pale green leaves and then send up cautiously and shyly the fragile bells that look as though a breath would blow them away the woodruff also sets to work for there must be beauty of odor as well as beauty of color and form and something will be needed to take the place of the violets when they go by this time the bluebells are ready to come out but there is no shyness about these sturdy in their growth no obstacle seems to hinder them up come the green spears making their own way through dead leaves and twigs and moss and acorn cup through thickets of low-lying bramble through carpets of close-growing ivy if a dead branch or a tree trunk 
lies in their way they peep out at one side is there a trifle of daylight here and up they come carpeting with blue the open spaces between the huge masses of rock that lie pell-mell about the surface while the humble little ground ivy lays cool green fingers and a little later as violet blue flowers over the cream and silver of the birches the soft gray of the beeches and the rough bark of the oaks where the felled trunks lie among the upspringing grass sensing for the last time the coming of spring and summer on the hillside then it is when the bluebells have turned to papery seed pods and the primroses have paled away into space that the foxgloves begin to shake out their flowers and the hillside glows and palpitates with color they flourish with a joyous abandon that is positively infectious and makes one feel there is still much left to live for the way they suddenly appear when the trees are down whole battalions of them where only a season before there were regiments of larches or thick woods of mixed timber is really marvellous undoubtedly the ground must be packed with seed more than this there must always be young seedlings coming up among the undergrowth or in sheltered crevices where the larch needles do not penetrate for no sooner are the trees cut then foxgloves start to spread their leaves to the light and by the following summer often before half the timber has been carried you find them by the thousand and that is a very low estimate dotted all over the rough land and with a host of ferns trying to cover up all that is maimed and bare and jagged to hide the scars where the mighty have fallen to give beauty for ashes in a very literal sense moreover there seems an almost uncanny intelligence in the way they adapt themselves to their environment you would think they knew that the winds from the far-off channel blow strong at times across these high open spaces for you find that they invariably place themselves in the shelter of a big boulder or settle down in a little hollow with a protecting flank of rockery evidently conscious that their tall stems would be lashed down flat if exposed to the full force of the wind or you find them growing it may be at the foot of a crumbling gatepost or against an ivy-covered rock or rows of them nestling close up to a lichen-covered stone wall and in this way their beauty is enhanced by the background and when they find themselves in an uncongenial setting springing up in the very centre of a woodland path perhaps or out in the open where the woodmen have been lopping the branches from a felled tree and there is much devastation to be covered over and atoned for there the foxglove lays its leaves as flat as possible against the earth so as to offer the least inducement to the passer-by to injure it and though it still sends up its flowers as bravely as it knows how they are only a foot high not the five and six feet of the foxglove in the shelter yet if it be possible in the least bit possible it leans against the pile of faggots or gently touches the desolate trunk of what was once a majestic old tree and who dare say that the silent companionship counts for nothing as i write this in a year of the awful war there are some who would tell me that foxgloves will not find the people in food while others see no value in the larches apart from their service as mine props yet while i would not underestimate the utilitarian worth of crops and timber the age-old truth is still insistent man cannot live by bread alone you may clear from the surface of the land every plant that is not edible you may fell every tree that does not serve for telegraph pole or pitwood you may tabulate the food productive qualities 
of the whole earth and serve it out in a blue book as literature for the people you may manufacture electricity till there is no longer any night and the mysteries of the twilight and the moonlight and the starlight are lost to us forever you may destroy the birds till there isn't one glad song left in the caterpillar riddled orchards and gardens you may harness the rivers and streams for mechanical purposes and drown the voices of the weir and the whir of wheels till there isn't an ounce of energy flowing to waste throughout the length and breadth of the country you may turn all nature into a huge commercial enterprise that is the last word in economics and efficient organization and what will be the result machines in place of souls germany strove to subserve everything to her own materialistic ends and the price of her hideous and colossal crime is a world's agony though this may seem but a parable to some the reading will be clear where there is no vision the people perish end of chapter eighteen the carillion of the wilds end of between the larchwoods and the weir by flora clickman